Welcome to DWeb Decoded, live from the beautiful Davos against the backdrop of the World Economic Forum. I am your guest host for today's episode, Rachel Horn, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Filecoin Foundation. And I am joined by Danny O'Brien. Hello. He is a senior fellow and DWeb strategy at Filecoin Foundation. And what I'm hoping that we'll do here for the next 30 minutes or so, uh -huh. internally, we're going to take you behind the scenes of Filecoin Foundation's uh, offices. We have these Danny chat sessions where we just let Danny unfurl everything that he knows <laughs> about a certain topic and ask it's as a many nice job questions. If you can get it. Yeah. It is awesome. And we all love Danny chats. And so I thought this could be a special Danny chat episode. So welcome. Okay, no pressure, no but pressure. yes, yes, gonna... it is true. Once started, it's hard to stop me. That's right. So uh, happy to help. Well, thanks. So the theme of this year's Davos is about responsible innovation in the age of AI, okay? <sighs> what have you heard up and down the promenade? What has been the ratio of conversations? Has it been traditional business, TradFi, AI, crypto? What are you hearing? It's super interesting, right? Because it's kind of the second year of AI. Like last year, you, three years ago, it was crypto as far as the eye could see. And there's a, for those of you who don't know Davos, uh, the, the main street of this tiny sort of chalet village is full of these, these signs from all these uh, up and coming companies and uh, established ones. And uh, uh, three years ago, uh, it, was, it was all crypto. Last year, it was all AI. This year, I think like the new entrants have sort of diminished a little bit and now we're getting a return to the people who've always been there, which is sort of the meta and the Microsoft. And I think they're taking up that AI mantle, mm -hmm. right? It's it's less, oh, there'll be plucky, plucky upstarts here, but like after OpenAI, no one, yeah. right? Like this will just be the big names. And so I think that's kind of sad in a way because I think that there's always like a code to things like this. So when people talk about responsibility, yeah. I always, I, I'm always a little bit suspicious because responsibility means, hey, now this sounds a little dangerous. Perhaps we should put, put it in trustworthy hands and those trustworthy hands always turn out to be the people who are currently in power, right. or at least maybe I'm a Davos cynic, but that's how it feels. And so for me right now, what it is, is an attempt to take uh, the power that's come out of the AI genie lamp. I don't know what analogy you would use. And then scurry it back into the established players again. Right. And we've seen this trend before, right? I mean, Danny, I know in our Danny talks with you, you often talk about the history and generational iterations of the internet, right. web one, web two, web three, where it ultimately ends up with this consolidation of power in the hands of a few. Right. I always talk about re-decentralization because there have been this, it's almost like a, a, a pendulum swing, right? You, uh, with computing power, there's always some uh, a, a, a temporary efficiency or temporary capability or temporary access to capital that uh, uh, large centralized organizations or states have, which sort of sucks the computing power and let's face it political power all kinds of things happen in this in this uh, uh sort of pendulum movement it gets sucked in and then people the the cumulative damage of that the, the the downside of that becomes more and more prevalent until you have this sort of prometheus moment where somebody breaks out of it right. comes out and says hey all power to to the people or whatever and uh and then we have this for me the most exciting part right where something happens and everybody gets a little a little bit of access they get more autonomy they get more control and they they I feel like a lot of the anxiety that people have about technology is about just feeling helpless and not feeling yeah. under control and the best solution for that is to give people control back right so this is a perfect segue, right, to talk about what does it mean to decentralize AI, to break up these monopolies. And um, of course, here at Filecoin Foundation, we, we really focus on decentralized storage, but we've actually had a number of big AI-related announcements, working with Aether and Bagel and Nucle AI, these AI agent projects, many of whom are, are exploring how to use Filecoin right. uh, for decentralized storage. So, so talk to us a little bit about like what is the interplay between 
Filecoin and AI. Okay, so so if you are re-decentralizing or, or, or decentralizing, right, one of the things that you need is uh, the primitives, right? The little the little units that you can build up to do do these things. And so the first burst of the internet was when. Um, uh, the military research and, and, and general academic research into distributed systems came up with some really good, uh, I mean, primitives is a strange word, but like the, the, like the little basic components, right? Like, like the first person who came up with multiplication, right? You suddenly go, oh, I now have this thing that lets me do other things. Um, so you come up with these little units and suddenly you go, oh, now we can build a network, right? We can connect lots of things together. So TCP IP, which is the, the, the underlying, um, a uh, way to speak to lots of computers individually on a large distributed network was the thing that caused the the internet to explode. Um, what we've been doing at Filecoin is trying to build one of these primitives, uh, which is the one around storage, because one of the things that sucked everything back into uh, these um, uh, prisons, right, of, of, of centralized uh, uh, control was, where do you store this right. data, right? And if somebody comes along, like Amazon, who I think are over there somewhere, <laughs> uh, and says, hey, you can store it all on our computers, um, then you put it there, and then you always have to refer to it, right? right? You always have to point your servers there, and it's a real hassle to, like, say, actually, we're really unhappy because now we're spending thousands right. and thousands of dollars with Amazon. We'd like to move it here. And then your engineers say, <laughs> now we're going to have to change every single signpost and address and right. pointer in the thing. So, so we built a thing that that meant that you didn't have to do that, right? That you would say, here is the data, and wherever it is, you you will be able to find it. And we built up the network like that. With AI, um, you need to do decentralized AI. And I think the thing that's important here is to understand that the first wave of this this revolution of AI was centralized, right? It's very resource intensive, very capital intensive, very energy intensive, very expertise intensive. And what companies would you put in that? Uh, just open AI, really. Okay. Open okay. AI and uh, um, uh, Google with um, uh, their, their learning stuff. A lot of the expertise was there because you needed a, a huge amount of capacity and a huge amount of data. So uh, the... Um, primitives, the basic units of like, okay, how do we do this in a decentralized uh, way were, I would say latent, right? Like they, it wasn't like people weren't thinking about this. It's just that they certainly weren't getting the capital investment or the application um, that they, they are now. So now as people realize the consequences of having all of that stored in one place and not just individuals, but you know, nation states, everybody's like going, huh, do I really want to have all my data sucked up into, into these giant centrally things controlled by a handful of right. people? People are looking at these primitives and it, it happens we kind of planned it this way, but 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 it happens that the Filecoin decentralized storage thing is one of those things that you need because for um, for training and to a lesser extent, sort of like more processing after that, you do need these very large petabyte level uh, amounts of data, and you need to know where they come from yep. optionally. And and I hear this phrase verified. Uh, verifiable data, verifiable AI. Can you sort of explain yeah, what that means? I, so this is interesting, right? Because I think it crosses over a couple of things. One is uh, people are worried because they know that AI, uh, large language models hallucinate, right? They come up with, uh, they say false things. Um, they also a little bit worried because they're you know slurping up everything. The first GPT models really got a lot of their um, their information from Reddit, and people are going, "Really, I'm going to trust a thing that is like based on Reddit?" Um, and uh, so people start thinking about, "Okay, we want good data. We want verifiable data." Um, I think that's possibly true. I think within the AI community. Uh, I think that there's a I, I think that th there's a difference of opinion, right? That that 
the one thing that we've learned doing AI is just the more data mm -hmm. you throw in, the better it gets, even if the data isn't that high quality. Yeah. So some people are like, maybe we don't need that. But the place you do need verifiable data, right, is if you are not doing this in a centralized way. Uh, and this is why we've always worked really hard to build our systems to have data that you know is the data that you originally stored. Because you're working in an environment where um, when you do something, when you collect all this data or you, 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 you're running a process um, on a centralized system, really what's happening is you're, you're having to trust them, right? You're having to go, okay, I trust Sam Altman, I trust Jeff Bezos, right, to do it properly. And like, if they do it wrong, I can sue them. So, you know, it's fine. Um, in a decentralized way, you're like, whoa, okay, who, who's in charge here? Like, where, where is this data going? Um, so what we do is we build in the math, right? So that, so that you can trust essentially systems that, that underlying it, you, you might, you might not normally trust, right? So we have that verifiability built in. It always sounds such nonsense when you say mathematically verified, but but it's true, right? It's yeah. it's one of those basic primitives. All right. So uh, what that means is, is you have a greater level of trust in that data. So when people now are like going, well, where is OpenAI getting this data from, right? And they're like, you know, trust us. And we're going, actually, we kind of don't trust yeah. you with a systems that are built... Um, uh, over a, a distributed and decentralized way, we have at least because we have to have a way of saying this is where the data came from. This is the process we use. We did it in this reliably uh, understandable, computable way, and we can show you the receipts. Right. So, so to summarize, there's sort of like two places where Filecoin as a tool for AI projects can play. One is on like the computational capacity side, right? Just like right. having enough space to have the data to run the models. Right. And then the We're other, big enough to do it. Right. right. And on the other side is sort of like the archival layer, the archival opportunities with Filecoin, right? Because when you create a large, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, when you create okay. a large language model, you then want to have a house to store that data so that as you continue to build and refine that model, you can see the changes over time to the data. That's actually, that's, that's a, it, it, you've actually gone one step further than what I was talking about. So one of the other things that's hard, right, is you're dealing with this amount of data. Um, because we're kind of in the wild west in the early days of, uh, of large language models, right? They're just sort of throwing the data in, yeah. right? And I think it's fair to say, um, some of the models that we have built now, Nobody knows what data was used right. to make them, right? And this you see this in some of the lawsuits and things. Which just going, we just took everything we could and like just just threw it in, right? And that's great There's to get no, some, uh, you know, right? Uh, and that's that's good to get something going, right? But if you want to really refine this, you need to be reproducible, right? So let me give an example of some data that we have on on uh, the Falco network, which is Common Crawl. So Common Crawl is a public database of uh, a, a web crawl, which is sort of what search engines do, where they go around and collect all the public data to, to process. And uh, uh, there's a well-known public repository of this data, and we have that on Filecoin. And we have sort of, we're big enough to have the historical copies of that, right? Which is not something that's easy to store. Mm -hmm. So that means, like you say, you can you can watch the delta. You can go, okay, we did this training and then we did this training and we can tell the difference. The reason why people haven't done that before, and I think this is really the important thing to understand about AI right now, is that you couldn't do that before because every time you did that training, it would cost millions and millions of dollars, right? Because it, 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 you just had to use so much computing time. The last um, uh, big model that was released, actually released by a Chinese firm, DeepSeek, it's open source, but they said they they used, uh, they spent less than $100,000 training it. So the cost of training is going down, which means you can do this sort of pick and mix uh, approach. And it means that if you can get hold of the data, that's accessible to anyone in any company. And that's what you need to do the decentralization, right? Right now, we're, we, we can only go to Claude. We can only go to ChatGPT to get these services. What I want, really want as a 
uh, as a sort of vision of how computing should serve individuals on their own terms is a world where you can train one of these things for your own needs, right? So a vast repository of open data that anyone can access and build their own models. Right. And you can pick and choose as well. Like it's big enough to train, but if you don't want to use Reddit as your database, you right? Exclude, or you want to include, sure. you want to collect all the data in your own natural language, right? Or your own culture. I think it's really significant that, you know, both ChatGPT and OpenAI essentially see the world from a very American, well, possibly English, right? Framing. Uh, they're very English language. They do speak other languages, but it's definitely framed in that way. Um, I don't know whether DeepSeek has a particularly built-in sort of uh, 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 sinophile kind of point of view. Um, it certainly senses a few things in a way that that people have commented that some of the larger models from from Google and others have done. But those are things that are sort of out of your control, right? If Switzerland by, back here wants uh, an AI model that thinks of the world from a Swiss point of view, then that's something that they should be able to craft and make themselves, right? Uh, okay, so build this out for me, and we're going to leave with like this vision of what's to come. Okay. What do you hope to see? Let's say we are back here in seven years, 2030. Right. What do you hope to see is the relationship between these large, vast data sets stored on Filecoin and the AI models that are built upon them? What's your utopian vision? Okay, my utopian vision is one of the things that, that, it's really important. If you have one thing to take away from this to understand about AI is it's on one of those Moore's law descents, right? It's getting faster and better every single day, right? Which means it's very hard to predict the future, but you can at least look at the direction of it. So one of those things is, is that storage is always going to get cheaper. It's one of the, the predictions that we predicated building the Filecoin network on, right? So what you will have is a relationship between those two things. The models will get more decentralized and more usable. We'll be sitting there and in our pocket. We won't be using Apple's AI touch wood, right? We'll be using our, we'll have something which is our own assistant, which is our own, under our own control. And if we want to uh, home cook, right? We want to like cook up our own uh, model. We'll be able to do that. And the, the vast amount of data that you would need to do that will be available on the Filecoin network. And you may even take advantage of the distributed computation that we're beginning to introduce on the Filecoin network because we have this huge stash of GPUs in that network or as storage providers do. So uh, think of it as your own kitchen, right? The kitchen where you can build up the, the models and the tools that you need rather than having to go and beg at the feet of Microsoft or OpenAI to use their tools. That's great. Well, I hope to see this come to fruition. Me too. I hope we come back here in a few years and check in. I'm going to hold you to this. Okay. Okay. And uh, thanks again for joining us for this episode of DWeb Decoded.